Ah, oh, look at that hair. Ah, oh, that outfit, my God. Oh, I mean, look at that vest. I'm kind of a sucker for a guy with a ponytail. Hello, my name's Leija. I'm a real life lawyer and I'm on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. Today I'm gonna react to Aaron Brockovich. I have seen this movie before, however, I'm very excited to rewatch because as I recall, Aaron Brockovich is a bad bitch. We love a bad bitch here. This is the channel for bad bitches. So this movie is based on a true story, the story of a woman named Aaron Brockovich, who is still very much alive. She was born on June 22nd, 1960, making her a cancer Gemini cusp, which is very fitting. She's sassy and brassy, loves a little drama, and keeps it really aloof. In the 1990s, the firm that she was working for as a legal assistant ended up taking on a case against PG&E, a large electrics facility in California, who in the 1950s and 60s had used hexavalent chromium as a means of cooling their towers, but then just let it loose in local waterways, causing a contamination that spread for miles and created a lot of sickness in local residents. This all happened in a place called Hinkley, California. Aaron Brockovich has written two books, one of which was just released on August 25th. It's called Superman's Not Coming, our national water crisis and what we the people can do about it. This is not sponsored, I was just excited to see that at the same time that I wanted to watch Aaron Brockovich for fun, there's also something relevant in the news about it. I'll link it below. Okay, let's watch it. Ah, look at that hair. What I would do for a little more volume. nowhere his jaguar comes racing around the corner like a bat out of hell. They took some bone from my hip and put it in my neck. I don't have insurance so I'm about $17,000 in debt right now. I, I couldn't take painkillers because they made me too groggy to take care of my kids. I just want to take good care of my kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Is your ex-husband helping out? Which one? There's more than one? Yeah, there's two. He one. knows there's more than one. Well, you must have been feeling pretty desperate that afternoon. What's your point? Broke, three kids, no job. A doctor in a Jaguar must have looked like a pretty good meal ticket. Objection, Steve. He hit me. So you say. Let's talk about witnesses. So she's probably suing that driver on a theory of negligence, meaning that he was driving negligently, his negligence caused him to hit her, and that because of his negligence, he owes her money for her damages. You can usually receive money damages for medical expenses that you incurred, lost wages that you might have suffered due to your injury, and sometimes for pain and suffering. Usually punitive damages, which are damages that are meant as punishment, that are above and beyond the actual harm that occurred and are just meant to deter the person or to punish them for what they did, those are generally not available in these types of tort cases. A tort, again, like I've explained in other videos, is a civil action that one person can bring against another person for an injury that they have suffered at the hands of that other person. So here you have the tort of negligence probably, so she's suing, saying that he owed her a duty of care, meaning that he owed her the duty to drive like a reasonable person would. He breached that duty when he ran that red light, and that breach of that duty caused her injury, and that the damages that she suffered were because of him, and he owes her money for that. You'll notice in that clip that the light was red, according to our eyes and what we saw, when he ran it. So theoretically, she would be in the right here. However, in a situation where maybe it's just he said, she said, where he's saying that he had a green light and she ran the red light, and she's saying that she had a green light and he ran the red light, then it's up to the jury to determine who is the more credible person and who they are going to believe. So in this situation, I'm assuming there probably weren't any eyewitnesses, otherwise it wouldn't have gone to trial. If there was an eyewitness that's saying, I saw it, she had a green light and he ran the red light, they probably would settle out of court because there's nothing really to dispute at that point. But here, because they're in trial, they're in Sit, clearly sitting in front of a jury, that's probably because there maybe were no eyewitnesses, is a guess I'm making. So here, the credibility of each person, of her versus him, is really important because the jury has to determine who they believe, because if they believe him, then he wins, and if they believe her, then she wins. So you see her being painted as the victim by her own attorney, saying that, you know, she just wants to be a good mother and a good citizen, blah, blah, blah. And that's a huge part of when you bring witnesses before a jury, is you need to determine how the jury is gonna feel about that witness, because 
because if a jury doesn't like your witness for whatever reason, that's gonna make them a very weak witness and it's not going to create a strong case for you. So he's trying to paint her as this victim, as someone who really cares about being a responsible mother and a responsible citizen, because that's gonna make her look good to the jury. So in contrast then, the defendant's attorney on cross-examination, cross-examination is when the attorney is examining the other party's witness. So in this case, she is her own witness for her case and the defendant attorney is cross-examining her. So on cross-examination, he's trying to call her credibility into question so that the jury doesn't believe her story and instead believes his client's story. So of course he's turning to the desperate woman trope because that's a fan favorite. So her finances and how many husbands she's had seems irrelevant to whether or not this guy was negligent when he hit her. However, you can do what's called impeach a witness, which is when you stand up and you question them to show that they're not credible to the jury so the jury doesn't believe them. You can impeach someone by showing that they have bias or a motivation to do something. So here he's showing that she's biased because she's just trying to get money out of this guy because he's got a nice car, he's a doctor, of course he probably has money, that's motivation for her to lie, basically. So he's calling her credibility into question in front of the jury to try to convince them that she's not the party that they should believe and that they should believe his client instead. So witness prep is a huge part of litigation. If you have a witness that you're calling to the stand, you want to make sure that they are prepared and know what kinds of questions not only you as their attorney are going to ask, but what the other attorney is probably going to do. You usually have a pretty good idea of that other side's case because of the filings that you have to do back and forth before litigation gets to trial. So you have a general idea of their arguments and what they're going to try to say that your client is doing or not doing. So her attorney probably already knew that the other side was going to paint her as a needy, desperate woman who was just taking advantage of the situation to get money. So she should have really been prepped for that type of cross-examination before she ever sat in that witness stand. Do they teach lawyers to apologize? Because you suck at it. Sure don't. Ah, that outfit, my God. Don't let anyone ever tell you that leopard print is not a neutral. What are you doing making all that goddamn noise? Well, uh, I don't know. We're just introducing ourselves to the neighborhood, I guess. Well. Is it weird that I'm into Aaron in this movie? Is that weird of me? He's kind of hot, right? Even with that weird facial hair? I'm kind of a sucker for a guy with a ponytail. So sue Aaron, me. Where You'll lose. So my name's George. What's yours? George. Me as the Look, uh, now you may want, and now that you're working here, you may want to uh, rethink your wardrobe a little. Why is that? Well, I think uh, some of the girls uh, are a little some uncomfortable girls, huh? because of what you wear. Is that so? Well, it just so happens I think I look nice. And as long as I have one ass instead of two, I'll wear what I like if that's all right with you. You might want to rethink those ties. Well, first of all, I'd like to compliment her earring choice. But also I kind of want to talk about what it's like to be a lady in the law. So this scene really spoke to me for a lot of reasons, but I think it's something that a lot of women experience, really no matter what field you're in, but I've experienced it especially in the law. Not to say that I've experienced any comments like this, but I've seen other people experience it, and the amount of self-policing that I've experienced as a person who is trying to succeed in the legal field is basically having this guy's voice in my brain at all times saying like, you look like a slut. You you probably shouldn't wear that. No one's gonna take you seriously. Would a man wear that? You need to look expensive, but not too expensive. You need to look like a lady, but not too much like a lady. You need to act like a man, but not too much like a man. You need to be perfect, but not too perfect. It's constant. It's this constant voice I have in the back of my head and I cannot imagine I'm alone in this. And I think the legal field in terms of accepting women has improved a ton over the past decade, at least white women. Race in the legal field, I could make many just separate videos on and that's a whole other issue. But in terms of being a white woman in the legal field, it's not really that edgy anymore. There's a lot of us. So I imagine back when this was filmed and when it actually happened in the 90s, women experienced a lot more of this in the workplace. But even now in 2020, I 
feel this policing voice every day when I show up in professional spaces. And this is something that men just don't have to deal with at the same level. I mean, you wear a suit and a tie, that's what you do. Sometimes you take your suit jacket off if it's a little warm and you roll up your sleeves and then you look like a really liberal, fun politician. Like, those are your two options. Sleeves unrolled with a suit jacket on or suit jacket off, sleeved rolled up, choose a tie that's a little sassy and people think you're fun. Of course, that can be kind of limiting, but at least it's something that fits them. Like, suits were made to fit male bodies. Now, as women, we're expected to show up in a business professional workplace and just kind of know how to navigate it, despite the fact that for most of time, it's been men in suits. And you know what doesn't look good on a traditionally female body? Suits. It doesn't look good. It's a boxy thing. It's not meant to fit any sort of curve whatsoever. But I'm just expected to roll right on in and know exactly what to do. Of course, they've made suits that kind of fit lady bodies, and I love a good suit jacket over a sassy outfit, but it just doesn't fit my body. I got a booty. I got a waist. Like, what am I supposed to do with all this baggy crap? So I've spent years just trying to figure out what I can wear, what's appropriate, what looks good and professional but still expresses my personality, but then there's the whole idea that lawyers are supposed to be these like law drones and we just walk around talking about laws and being really boring and kind of awkward and we just all look the same and do the same thing and we're just robots. That's not the case and it's becoming less and less the case as people with actual personalities join the legal field. That was mean. People in the legal field have always had personalities but I'm just saying some of us are getting a little sassier is all. And I want to be able to show that sass off through what I wear but I can't because I'm constantly navigating these waters as a woman. And again, I'm a white woman. All I have to navigate are the waters of clothing. I don't have to worry about whether or not my hair is the right texture for my workplace or whether I'll be a cultural fit. Those are whole other big issues that are just not even on my plate and I'm stressed the hell out. I guess what I've determined in all of this is something that I think Aaron Brockovich really embodies and that is that you need to wear what you feel comfortable in and what makes you feel good because that's how you're gonna be the best advocate. I know that when I'm wearing something that makes me feel feminine and sassy and fun and cute, then I'm gonna show up to work and wanna do good work and not be sitting around thinking about how big and frumpy I feel. So I've determined to stop giving a shit about what other people think and wear what makes me feel good and I think Aaron does this very well in this movie and and I just wanted to highlight that. Let's move on. <laughs> oh, I mean, look at that vest. Hi. Hi. Donna Jensen? Yes. I'm uh, <clears throat> Aaron Brockovich with Masri and Vitito. Oh, you're a lawyer? Hell no. <gasps> I hate lawyers. I just work for them. <laughs> um, do you have a minute? So y you didn't put the house up for sale. They just came to you and wanted to buy it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't want to move. Well, I guess the only thing that confused me is, and not that your medical problems aren't important, but how come the files on that are in with all the real estate stuff? Well, they paid for the doctor's visit. Why'd they do that? Because of the chromium. The what? The chromium. Okay, so let's talk about client interviews. Okay, so being good at interviewing clients is a really important thing both for an attorney and for a legal assistant. Like in this situation, Erin is not an attorney. She hates attorneys, which, fair. I worked as a legal assistant myself for a couple of years before going to law school and a huge part of that job is interviewing clients and getting the full story so that the attorney can start building a case for them. But even as an attorney you have to know how to talk to your clients. And this is I think a really good example of that because she knew the type of client that she was talking to. She was gonna go into this rural small town where people were just scraping by day to day and were sick and were having their houses preyed upon by this large company and she clearly is able to sit down with them and express empathy to what they're going through and to actually sit and listen and ask questions. Because so much of what happens when you're interviewing a client is that they'll come to you with a story but they don't know the, the important parts of it for building a legal case. They're just gonna start rambling on and on about something that they need your help with and you need to know how to listen and ask questions and be empathetic and also get all of the pertinent information out of them. For example, here she's like, oh yeah, it's the chromium. She didn't know that this is a huge issue that could be part of a legal case. So being able to talk to clients and be personable and be empathetic and get the story out of them because they trust you is huge. And it's something I think a lot of lawyers overlook. I mean, we do have a bad rap for being kind of sleazy people and a lot of us aren't. Some of the best people I've ever met have been lawyers, but some of the worst people I've ever met or heard of have been lawyers too. So we run the gamut. I mean, we have a bad rap for a reason and some of that comes down to ability to empathize with people. 
So here I think is a really good example of a good client interview because you're getting information out of them and you're building trust. However, I would say that usually a legal assistant isn't gonna go alone to a client's house without specific directives from the lawyer because oftentimes the legal assistant is not gonna know enough about the law to know exactly what details to get out of a client. However, in these early initial stages of a case, especially a case that seems to be pro bono, meaning for free, that the attorney is taking on kind of as a side project that isn't super time sensitive, maybe sending a legal assistant out to get initial information makes sense. But eventually I would say that there would need to be some sort of assistance on the lawyer's part to say, okay, we need to get this information so that we can build this case properly. However, there are obviously legal assistants who have worked for a really long time in certain legal fields and so they know enough, probably could be lawyers themselves, and know what to get out of clients. But yeah, based on my experience, part of what makes a person a good lawyer or a good advocate, as she is here, even though she's not a lawyer, is being able to sit down and have a active listening, empathetic conversation with your client and leave your ego at the door. Something that a lot of lawyers are kind of bad at. What kind of chromium is it? There's more than one type. Yes, there's a straight up chromium, does all kinds of good things for the body. There's chrome three, which is fairly benign. And then there's chrome six, hexavalent chromium, which depending on the amounts can be very harmful. All right, so here she's consulting with an expert, which is pretty realistic. So when forming a case, a lawyer or their assistant is gonna go and speak with experts to determine what the case is, what they're even working with, especially when you have issues where there's a chemical or any sort of other science-based issue. A lot of lawyers love to make the joke that they went to law school because they were told there would be no math involved. We need experts to come in and help us out. So that's what she's doing here. She's consulting with an expert in chromium to help build the case against PG&E. A lot of times experts will consult with the attorneys. They'll also prepare reports for attorneys that they can then use in their court filings. And sometimes experts testify in court as expert witnesses. Each side can get their own experts on the same issue. However, they are expected to have a similar level of expertise, the level that someone in their field would generally have. And the court is the one that determines whether or not a witness has the proper expertise. And there's all types of experts that lawyers consult with. You have forensic experts, which you see all the time on shows like Law & Order. You also have scientific experts like this, you have doctors, you also have financial experts who can analyze complex data and financial reports. This is all in an effort to help the fact finder, usually a jury, but sometimes the judge, depending on what the case is. It helps them to know more about the background of the case and it helps the lawyers to know more about the background of the case so that they can properly form legal arguments based on this information. One thing to note though is that experts are expensive, like tens of thousands of dollars go to experts and that's why these type of litigation that requires expert testimony can get really, really expensive. Okay, so here she's at a local water authority in Hinkley looking at records and she finds something that, that basically was a cleanup order that could be really helpful in their case. And what she's doing here is commonly known as doc review, which is where an attorney or their assistant will go and look through a bunch of documents in order to find something that will be helpful for the case. This case was in the 90s and back then doc review usually involved a lot of physical paper and sifting through boxes and boxes. Sometimes those boxes of documents were kept in warehouses in like the middle of Ohio or something. So a big part of especially a newer attorney's job Job was to go to a large warehouse and just sit in there for days, sometimes weeks, and sift through boxes of stuff, hoping that you can find documents that will be helpful for your case. Nowadays, a lot of doc review happens on the computer, so you can suffer from the comfort of your own home. This is usually an attorney's job, not an assistant's job, because as I've said before, a lot of times an assistant probably wouldn't know exactly what they're looking for unless they've been given explicit guidance from an attorney. And in this case, it doesn't look like she's consulted with anyone about what she's doing so I'm not really sure how she knows what she's looking for but I mean you know especially with assistants who have done a lot of work in a certain area of law they're gonna know more about what they're looking for but usually it's an attorney like a junior attorney's job to go and sift through documents. I have to say though that sometimes in doc review when you finally find that document or that piece of information that really helps the case or seals the deal or is really incriminating or something it's really exciting it's like you're a detective on a mission so there are positive aspects to doc review for sure. Here. 
What's going on? Well, there may be jobs where you can disappear for days at a time, but this isn't one of them. Here, you don't do the work. You don't get to stay. I've been... Okay, that, that confirms what I thought, and that is that she just was going off and not telling anyone what she was doing, which is a little unrealistic, because how the hell would she know what she's doing or what she's looking for, because she's had this job for like a few months, but... You know, Erin Brockovich, she's an unprecedented kind of legal assistant, so what do I know? Why not just keep quiet about it? To establish a statute of limitations, in a case like this, you only have one year from the time you first learn about the problem to file suit. So PG&E figures... Well, we'll let the cat out of the bag, tell the people the water's not perfect. And if we can write out the year with no one suing, we'll be in the clear forever. Okay, so what he's saying here is that a statute of limitations exists that's one year from the time you discover the injury in this lawsuit. A statute of limitations is just a limit on the amount of time you have to bring a lawsuit. And it's set by statute, obviously, and the beginning of the statute of limitations depends on what the statute says. So here it starts when the person finds out about the injury in this case. Some statutes of limitation start from the time of injury. This is important to know because if it's from the time of injury, especially when it comes to a toxic situation like this where maybe you were infected a year ago but you didn't find out that you had cancer until later, the damage has already been done and if you start counting it from the time the actual injury occurred, you'd never have the ability to even bring a lawsuit. So here's a slightly more lenient statute of limitations, meaning that it doesn't start running until you actually find out that you've been injured as opposed to from the date of the actual injury. But here they have one year to bring a lawsuit and after that year passes, they cannot sue. The reason we have statutes of limitation is to make sure that people People are bringing lawsuits in a timely manner. This is important because witnesses can forget and evidence can become damaged or be lost or age and we want to make sure that we're getting things litigated as quickly as possible. Plus we don't want to have our court systems clogged up with multi-decade old litigation. Uh, murder does not have a statute of limitations. Fun fact. I not say here how much this whole thing's gonna cost us. My fee's 40% of whatever you get awarded. So that fee that he's talking about is what's known as a contingency fee arrangement. Basically, there's a couple ways that lawyers get paid. The two most common are an hourly basis. So I count how many hours I worked for you and I charge you based on that time or a contingency fee basis, which as he explained here is when you do the work and you bring the case and however much money they win, the lawyer takes a percentage of that. 40% is kind of high, but it's pretty typical. I've mostly seen a third. And it's basically a way to ensure that people who maybe don't have cash reserves to bring a lawsuit can still bring a suit. And it ensures that the lawyer is actually going to work in the person's best interest to get them as much money as possible because the lawyer gets paid based on how much they make. So if they don't win anything, the lawyer doesn't make any money. Whether that amount of taking that 40 percent is ethical is another question but it is a typical fee arrangement that attorneys use oh, the only reason pg and is even talking to us is because this is a quiet little real estate dispute we had plaintiffs suddenly we're in the middle of a toxic tort with a statute problem against a massive utility no thank you don't you ever just know you also just know where the money's coming from that's why most of these cases settle lack of money you know what toxicologists and geology experts cost we're looking at a hundred grand a month easy. All right, let's talk about toxic torts. So basically this lawyer is playing it safe, which a lot of lawyers do, by instead of bringing a whole lawsuit against PG&E for their contamination, he's instead saying, well, you know, you wanna buy my client's land, pay them more money because we know that you dumped toxic chemicals into the ground and caused them a lot of sickness. So pay them more money for the land and it'll all go away. This is a lot safer than bringing an entire case. As he just said, and as I noted before, ex experts are really expensive. The case could get drawn out. PG&E is a huge company that has a lot of resources. They can pay lawyers to just draw out the case for years and years, and he's just a small practice that doesn't necessarily have the resources to fight this huge company. Um, the case that he would bring is called the Toxic Tort Case. As I was mentioning before, a tort is a civil case that you bring against a person or entity that has injured you. So in this case, the plaintiffs would be the sick people that live in Hinkley, and the defendant would be PG&E. It's a 
toxic tort because it has to do with a chemical and an extremely dangerous substance that led to sicknesses. Toxic torts are a special type of tort because of the level of expertise that they require. It's not only usually because there's a lot of experts that need to be involved because there's science, but also because it's harder to pin causation when you have a toxic tort situation like this. So for example, someone who lives two miles away from the PG&E facility has cancer 15 years after they dumped this toxic chemical. It's gonna be a lot harder to get the amount of information and facts and proof that you need in order to tie PG&E's negligence or fraud or misrepresentation to the harm suffered by your plaintiff. So toxic torts are a lot more difficult, they're a lot more complex, and they're often larger litigation. And because of that, that's why he's so leery to bring this case and why there's a whole special kind of section of tort law called toxic torts that some attorneys specialize in because they are such complex cases. Especially here where you have 600 plus plaintiffs. I have to tell you, I've been uh, making inquiries with other firms, bigger firms, to share some of the cost. They all said no, say we don't have it. Well, that's bullshit. We got PG&E by the balls. PG&E Hinkley by the balls, but nobody's going to get rich unless we can pin this on PG&E corporate in San Francisco. What do you mean? PG&E corporate is claiming they had no way of knowing what was going on in Hinkley. Oh, they knew. They had to know. Who showed me the document that proves it? Uh, and they didn't know. And if they didn't know, we can't hit them with punitive damages. And with punitive damages, we're talking about a sum of money that can actually have some effect on these, these people's lives. So punitive damages he's talking about here, that's what I was saying earlier about damages that are used as a means of punishing someone for something that they've done as opposed to just making the plaintiff whole again. So you've got a number of different types of damages, medical expenses, lost wages, things like that, and then punitive damages would be on top of the expenses that were incurred because of the injury and they would be a deterrent for that entity's actions or for future entity's actions. A discussion of damages is difficult though because when someone has cancer and dies or it's a child with cancer how are you supposed to put a monetary value on that and that's what a lot of people feel when they're left with getting damages only for medical expenses adding punitive damages on top of it kind of creates this feeling of justice because you're not only getting your damages paid for but you're also getting punishment on top of that in the form of money a lot of tort cases punitive damages are not available but in cases like this where the defendant acts in a grossly negligent way in a way that's kind of above and beyond what's just normal negligence but is atrocious or extremely unconscionable, that's where you're gonna see something like punitive damages. So here they're saying if PG&E corporate knew that this was happening and looked the other way or allowed it to continue, that's something that the court's gonna look at in determining whether or not to award punitive damages. And it could get them higher damages if corporate headquarters knew about it and did nothing. Let's assume there are documents connecting PG&E Hinkley with PG&E corporate, and they know these documents exist. We take our 400 or so uh, plaintiffs and everything you've dug up. We uh, file a lawsuit to provoke a reaction, see if they uh, offer a reasonable settlement or just throw more paper at us. Well, that sounds great. Let's do that. There's a downside. Uh, PG&E will submit a demur, a list of reasons attacking each complaint, claiming that each cause of action has no merit. And if the judge agrees with them, you dismiss our case, PG&E will have no reason to settle, then it's all over. All right, let's talk about demurs. So what he's talking about there is called a demurrer. It's an old English word that I have never figured out how to really say. He calls it a demur. It's spelled demurrer. It's not used super frequently, though in California they do still use it. It's basically when one party files a complaint, the other party objects to all the all or part of the arguments in there. Sometimes in other states it's called a motion to dismiss. There's a number of different reasons why someone would submit a demur or a motion to dismiss. Sometimes it's because the court doesn't have jurisdiction over the issue or the people in the case. Sometimes it's because the other side has failed to state a cognizable claim, meaning they haven't alleged facts to support every element of a claim. Demirs are used basically by one side to poke holes in the other side's complaint or argument. So here he's saying that if they submit something and it's insufficient, 
and the other side submits a demure and objects to certain aspects of it and says that, you know, they're, they're not even stating a cognizable claim, it's insufficient, it's not enough to continue forward with litigation, the judge then would have to look at that and determine which side is right, if it has stated a full claim or if not. I have a couple other videos on ye old laws. I'll link them above. So often after a demure or a motion to dismiss is submitted, if the judge accepts the demure or motion to dismiss and dismisses the case, sometimes the plaintiff has the opportunity to amend their complaints to add more information to it to try to overcome that dismissal. And sometimes the dismissal will be without prejudice, meaning that the plaintiff can bring the case again in the future and maybe change the complaint so that it alleges more facts so that it's sufficient enough to pass a motion to dismiss. Sometimes a motion to dismiss can be what's called with prejudice, which means that the plaintiff cannot bring the case again. And in this case, when they have hundreds of plaintiffs like this, every single plaintiff would be bound by that dismissal, meaning that none of these plaintiffs could ever bring another lawsuit based on the same theory of the same injury again. So there's a lot riding on this, and if it is dismissed, then they've really kind of messed up a lot of people's lives. That's why this is such a complex and scary case for them to be taking on. $20 million is more money than these people have ever dreamed of. Oh, see, now that pisses me off. First of all, since the demur, we have more than 400 plaintiffs in. Let's be honest, we all know there are more out there. They may not be the most sophisticated people, but they do know how to divide, and $20 million isn't shit when you split it between them. Aaron. Second of all, these people don't dream about being rich. They dream about being able to watch their kids swim in a pool without worrying that they'll have to have a hysterectomy at the age of 20. I want you to think real hard about what your spine is worth, Mr. Walker or what you might expect someone to pay you for your uterus, Miss Sanchez. Then you take out your calculator and you multiply that number by a hundred. Anything less than that is a waste of our time. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. Came from Well and Hinkley. Gotcha. All right, so I love that speech and you gotta love it when the underdog really sticks it to the man. But I will say, I don't think any legal assistant would ever be able to take the reins and just kind of run a meeting like that off the tracks when it's between attorneys who are trying to come to a settlement agreement. It is accurate, however, that they did win the demure, meaning that it was not dismissed and they got to move forward with the case, which does put them in a stronger position for negotiation purposes, because obviously the court saw merit in the case and so it could move forward to trial and that could be long and drawn out and could cost both sides a lot of money. Most cases settle outside of court in these types of settlement negotiations because both sides are calculating how much they want to lose and when you have a long drawn out court battle both sides lose a lot of money and here because the court did not dismiss the case there is merit in their arguments to a certain extent and I think that makes pg and &E a little bit more scared. Okay so this is another situation like I was talking about where if you're a lawyer going to interview a client, you gotta be able to like empathize with them and be a normal person. You don't show up to talk to a farmer in a full suit with a briefcase. He's not gonna wanna talk to you, come on. Get real. Binding arbitration isn't all that different from a trial. It's overseen by a judge. Evidence is presented in much the same way. And then a jury decides. <coughs> oh no, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, there's no jury in binding arbitration. No jury in all appeal. Well, what options do we have if we don't like the result, huh? Well, you have not. The judge's decision is fine. Not a good answer. No, no. Now, the point we have to address tonight is getting everyone to agree that going binding arbitration is preferable to a trial that could go on for 10 years before you see any money. Maybe some of us want to wait 10 years. I love how that cowboy has like a New York accent. Some of us don't want to wait 10 years. All right, let's talk about binding arbitration. Okay, so what he's saying here is accurate. In an arbitration setting, there is no jury. It's a less formal setting outside of the court system. If it's binding, then it cannot be appealed. Unlike in a court situation where a court's determination can be appealed to a higher court, when it's binding arbitration, that means that the decision is final and there's nowhere to 
appeal it, and courts will enforce the binding decision. The reason why some people choose arbitration over litigation in court is because it is less formal, will take less time, and usually a lot less expensive than going through court procedures. The parties are able to choose the arbitrator as opposed to in a court setting they are assigned a judge, and a lot of times arbitrators, especially in more complex situations, have more background knowledge than a judge would on the issue at hand. So here he's trying to get all of the plaintiffs to agree to arbitration because you have to agree to arbitrate. Sometimes you'll notice in contracts, for example, if you were to read the fine print, there are arbitration agreements where part of the thing that you're signing for is that if there's any sort of dispute that arises between you and the other person on the contract that an arbitration will be the way that you resolve the dispute and it won't go to court. This is on all sorts of contracts, but if you read the small print on any pop-up that you're signing when you're creating an account on a website or any waiver you sign or anything like that, a lot of times there's going to be an arbitration section that says that you agree to arbitrate in the location that the other party has determined is the appropriate location. So it'll say like, any dispute arising pursuant to this contract will be resolved via arbitration in California, for example. That's really common and that's something that most people don't know is in the fine print, but a lot of times you're agreeing to arbitration when you sign contracts. This is also typical when you're signing you know, any sort of agreement with, say, your cell phone company or your internet company or when you sign on to get a new credit card, you're often agreeing to arbitration on the other side's terms. So what Ed and I have been doing the last few days is putting together a present for you. 634. They're all signed. Internal PG&E documents all about the contamination. The one that I like best says, and well, I'm paraphrasing here, but it says, yes, the water's poisonous, but it would be better for all involved if this matter was not discussed with the neighbors. It's to the Hinkley Station from PG&E headquarters. How did you do this? Well, um, seeing as how I have no brains or legal expertise, and Ed here was losing all faith in the system, am I right? Oh, yeah, completely no faith, no faith. I just went up there and performed sexual favors. 634 blowjobs in five days. Good, that's a good one. So my civil procedure professor, my first semester of law school, played us this clip. I don't fully remember why. I think it's because we read a book called Buffalo Creek Disaster, which I recommend if you are really interested in these types of environmental lawsuits. Um, but it's basically about a town that sued a large company after a dam broke and flooded the entire town and killed a bunch of people and did a ton of damage. Um, and part of that case was trying to peg the local mining company's negligence on the larger parent company. So the mining company at the local level was a subsidiary of the parent company and there's this thing called the corporate veil or piercing the corporate veil where typically a parent company is shielded from liability for the things that their subsidiary does it's just a part of the legal business structure that we have in the United States however if there are certain instances of say fraud or where the parent company and the subsidiary intermingle so much that their separate identities become blurred, then you can do what's called pierce the corporate veil and get the parent company to have liability for something that the subsidiary company did. And so that's basically what this document here does because it says that PG&E corporate at the highest level knew that this negligence and that this misrepresentation was happening at the local level in Hinkley and they did nothing about it. And this document pretty much pegs them as knowing and doing nothing. And that's something that could help them pierce the corporate veil here. So I think that's why she played it for us, but it was a really kooky scene to watch in like your first semester of law school when you're all nervous and you're trying to be like this professional and you're, you know, trying to impress all your classmates and then your kooky civ pro professor puts up this scene where Julia Roberts' bra is sticking out and she talks about doing 600 sexual favors to get her job done. God bless it. I love it. All right, so this case did eventually end up settling for $333 million, which was the largest direct action settlement in U.S. history. The law firm that Aaron Brockovich worked for got 133 million of that settlement, their 40% that they agreed to. And of that, Aaron Brockovich did actually get a $2 million bonus. Not bad. I never made that much when I was a legal assistant. 
Oh, that was fun. You know I love a good movie about a sassy lady pushing boundaries. Are there any that I'm missing that I should comment on for future videos? Let me know below in the comments. If you have any other movies or TV shows that you want me to do a reaction video for, I'm super in. Let me know. Thank you for joining me for this reaction video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe below if you want to hear more from me. Thanks. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Done. Thank you.